Today in the Lightroom Whisperer, we're going to do something a little bit different than normal. I recently made a video on how to plan and pack for a photo trip. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll throw a banner up above so you can go check it out. In that video, I planned for a trip to Death Valley, and in today's, I'm going to take the pictures that I took on that trip and show you my workflow in Lightroom from start to finish. We're going to go from importing right from that memory card to organizing those photos to be able to find them for later. I'll show you how I edit a couple of them all the way through the export so I'm able to email them to some friends and family to share them with them. There's a lot to do today, so let's get right to it. Before we jump into it though, did you know that you and I could actually work live remotely one-on-one -on, -one on Lightroom? Whether you're trying to troubleshoot an issue, learn the basics, establish a workflow, or go deeper into editing, a one-on-one -on -one might be just what you need. I'll pop a link down in the description below for more information. As for now, let's get back to today's lesson. Now we're going to start at the very beginning, and that's going to be getting the images into Lightroom. This in Lightroom is known as importing. Importing, along with a lot of the other things that we talk about in this, I have much more in-depth videos to highlight all of those. If there's something pertaining to a specific topic, I'll end up putting a banner up above to the more in-depth video, and I'll also throw descriptions down below in the meantime. As for today, we're going to go through an import directly from my memory card, right through a card reader into my computer, or actually in my case, onto an external hard drive. You might be going directly from your camera, and whether you're doing it through a card reader or your camera, some people prefer to have either Lightroom do this, or they like to drag their files over first, put them in a folder or on their desktop, and then have Lightroom know where they are. Personally, I like to let Lightroom do that transfer because if it officiates that, it knows where everything is. I never get those question marks or exclamation points saying, hey, where's this picture? Where's this folder? So in this case, I'm gonna let Lightroom take care of that whole import. When I plug my memory card in now, it's gonna automatically note that I've done so, and it's gonna bring up the import window. Now, if it didn't do that, there's a little button on the bottom down here that I can use that says import, and that's going to allow me to then initiate that import. My preferences are set up, though, to do this for me. Now, right out of the bat, let's just talk about the basics of what we see right here. Lightroom kind of works in a top to bottom, left to right kind of hierarchy. So in this case, if we see Leica M, that's the camera that I was taking pictures with, it's copying those files to a hard drive. And in this case, it's actually not where I want it to go. So we're gonna have to tell it where I want it to go. We'll get to that in a second though. Let's say I had my phone also plugged in right now. In addition to Leica M, if my phone had pictures on it, Lightroom might've seen those and thought that was what I was trying to import. If it chose incorrectly, you can look down on the side here and you can identify, okay, here my pictures are coming from Leica instead of iPhone, for instance. Now this chose correctly, so I don't have to worry about that. The other thing I'm looking at over here is it says eject after import. That's gonna tell me that it's gonna automatically eject this memory card, so I don't have to drag it into the trash or to the little eject file before I remove it. After the import's done, Lightroom will take care of that for me. Now let's move over a little bit to that next column. Copy is what we're doing right now. And you can see actually move and add or grayed out. I actually can't choose those. And that's because we're coming from a memory card. Now, if you're the type of person that isn't coming from a memory card, you're coming from somewhere you put your pictures on your computer, or they already live somewhere and you're just telling Lightroom where they are, then the add would be what you're actually doing. They're in the place where they're going to live. You just want Lightroom to pretty much know their address. What are we bringing into Lightroom? All photos is checked, so it's going to try to bring in every picture on this memory card. But you can see I have quite a few of them that are grayed out right here. Now, I actually did not format my memory card before I went out to take pictures again at Death Valley. So the pictures you see grayed out, those are already in my Lightroom catalog. Lightroom remembers they're there, and it's not going to let me bring those files in again. And the reason why it's not going to let me duplicate those files, have multiple copies of them, is because on this right side, do not import suspected duplications is checked. I make sure that box is checked multiple times just to make sure I'm not bringing in two or three or four copies of the same file and just polluting my hard drive with unnecessary space. If we come down a little further, you'll notice that there's starting to be some pictures that aren't grayed out. Now there were two up above, 
I actually deleted these from Lightroom's catalog, but they're still on the memory card. So it's thinking that, okay, I don't know these. I can bring them in again. I don't want those to be coming in, so I can uncheck those files. If I scroll down a little more, you can see that we have files that are not grayed out, and these are the new images from Death Valley that I haven't brought into Lightroom yet. These are what we're going to be importing. And you can see that they are checked, and that means that they are identified as what I'm going to import. If there's ones that I know I don't want to bring in, like the first one you saw here is a little on the dark side. I'm not going to use that photo. I can uncheck that. It's not going to import that now. I'm just going to scroll down, make sure I've got all those pictures that I want there. And it looks like we're good. Now over on the right hand side, I'm going to look and see exactly where it's going to import my photos. When I work with people in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, that's the number one thing that I usually am asked is, where's Lightroom putting my photos? The answer to that is, where you told Lightroom to put your photos? In this case, it's asking me, where do you want them? And it's saying that it thinks that I want them in my hard drive, on my computer, in my pictures folder. And that's their default. That's where Lightroom automatically thinks that it should go. Now, if you imported somewhere else previously, Lightroom will remember that, and that's actually what you'll see up there. So I'm going to go over here and click on that area, and it's going to open a menu, and you notice there are a lot of options here for me, which you're not going to see. These are actually every hard drive I have ever brought images into, and Lightroom remembers that. That way, if it sees it again, it can instantly go there and choose it. Now, in this case, I want it to go to where I store most of my images, which is on my Genius Drive in my Lightroom Imports folder. So when I click that, it's now going to know that that's the location I want to store these, and it's going to put them there for me. I double check as I move down here. Don't import suspected duplicates. And at the time of importing, I'm going to add keywords that really identify things that every single picture I'm importing work within. So in this case, every picture was taken in Death Valley. Death Valley, for the most part, is in California, and all of these pictures were taken in the California part of Death Valley. But not every picture has a sand dune or a salt flat or unique things like that, so I'm going to wait to put in the more unique specified keywords for later. Now in this case, I'm going to just click there. You see it turn white, and that means I can start entering. I say Death Valley, and you notice it actually remembers me putting that in before. Comma, space. In this case, I'm going to type California. Comma, space. Now the comma is going to denote that it's a new keyword, so you notice Death Valley, two words. It'll identify that as one keyword because the comma's after it. California, it sees this as a separate keyword now. I'm going to go ahead and just run down to the bottom here and click Import Now. The date that you have set inside of your camera is how Lightroom identifies what the folder is that it needs to be named for. So if you have your date improperly set in your camera, it's going to put them in the wrong place here. Don't worry, you can change that around later on. You can move the files, you can rename folders. I have other videos that will address that. I also have other videos that really get into why I leave it in this date structure. Just kind of the easy explanation. Way down the road, it's a lot easier for me to find these pictures, kind of guessing roughly what the date was, versus trying to find them in some convoluted folder that's called Salt Flat or Death Valley or whatever I might have named it at the time and won't necessarily remember in five years down the road. So here, if I scroll down, we've got the 1028, 1029, and 1030 folders that it's created and it's imported my images into there. Now the next thing I do, I'm going to highlight all three of those, and I'm going to start to identify what I really want to work on, and I use my star ratings to do this. So for me, one star means I kind of want to look closer, Two stars means I think that's definitely worth spending some time on in the editing. Three stars I'm going to apply if I edit a photo, whether I like it or not, really. That's more of a progress stage for me more than anything. After three stars, it becomes more of a matter of do I like this enough to show to people? Or does it, you know, just kind of, it's an okay shot now that it's edited, but it's nothing I'm really, you know, willing to write home about. If it's something you want to show to people, it gets four stars from me. And when I use five stars, I use that sparingly. Those are the times that I have a shot that if National Geographic came knocking on that door, those are the ones I pull up. Five stars, real quick like. So now I start at the very beginning, 
and there's a lot of salt flat shots here. Some of them jump off the page, like I want to look closer, definitely. Others are maybe something I have to examine against another one because they're so close, but there's little differences that might make one stand out. I don't zoom in just yet. I go quickly over and look at the ones that I might want to say, oh, let's look at this and compare it to another one. And then in the next stage, I'm going to zoom in more. We're going to look more in depth then. And this will actually speed up your process later on. This is establishing a workflow, a habit from start to finish that's going to create a little bit more continuity through your process and just streamline things so you don't forget things in the long run. I'm going to start here. That one's pretty cool. I'm going to just go ahead and one. I can either hit the number one. I can tap below here on these little dots that show up and say that I want, if I click the first one, one. There's also a ratings video that I'll link up above here for you. Now these three are pretty similar. Let's call it these four. I want to look at them next to each other, so I'm going to highlight all of those and click one. We'll come back to them in the next stage. Move on. Kind of like that horizontal, the way it pulls in those more, and there's two there that are kind of similar. Let's go ahead and hit the one on there. You notice how I only have to click one on one of them when they're both highlighted, and it applies it to both of them. Those middle ones aren't really jumping off the page at me too much. This one's kind of cool with the way it's running in. Let's grab that little guy. Sunset's starting to kick in a lot more color now. After sunset, we get blue hour. These are a little different. Let's go ahead and choose this one too, maybe. Now I'm going to move on to two stars. Two stars is going to say, hey, I want to look at these a little bit closer overall and maybe bring it into editing. So to do so, I'm going to use my filters and we're going to find those right up here on the top. So we're going to go ahead and say filter rated. And now it only shows me the one star or above pictures so the ones that I just said, hey, let's look a little closer at, it's pulling those up for me now. Now let's take the ones that look similar, highlight all four of these, and I'm going to come down to the bottom toolbar. That's what this is called on the bottom over here. And I'm going to click that little guy, which brings us to survey view. Now I can look at these pictures and see if one of them grabs me more than another. In this case, you know, and the star of the show is the salt. And I do think that this kind of shows some more of the texture within there. Between these two, oh, I think I like the composition a bit more. Hmm. Maybe in this one, showing a bit more of that blue sky. So let's get rid of this one here. I can hit the X on the bottom. It's out of consideration. Now between these, let's see, is there something that grabs me more? I kind of like a lot shadowing we've got down here. Exposure wise, I could probably get quite a bit out of both of these in the editing process. Let's keep with the slightly darker one here. It's a little bit different as far as how high I am above it, and I like the way it kind of stretches the foreground differently. Now I could just edit both of these in the long run, or they're close enough that maybe one jumps off the page more than another at me. So in this case, I might look at them and say, huh. I actually do like maybe that salt in the foreground a bit more in the way it pulls you in detail-wise. That's probably the one worth my time later on. So I can go down here and hit two stars on it now, and that one's going to go to my next stage, my editing stage. Now I'm going to go back either to my grid view to choose the next set of pictures that are similar, which are these two. Or if we're really still in that loop view, down at the bottom, I have mine hidden, but you might actually be able to see yours. There's a film strip down here, and that film strip allows me to go and choose, let's say I want this one and that one for my next pictures. Now I can go and bring them up and look at them next to each other. Now the last one I had four pictures I started with. I have to go to survey view when I have more than two pictures. Let's say you have three through a hundred pictures you're trying to whittle down. Survey view is going to put them all on one screen for you and look at them in whole. Now that I have two pictures, I can go to something called compare view. So in this case, let's say I wanted to zoom in on the horizon or the foreground to see if it was really sharp in those uh, close salt crystals. I can instead of survey view, go to compare view. 
which now allows me to zoom in too to these photos. And as long as the bottom toolbar down here is locked in this function, it'll zoom both photos to the same place. And I can see if one is sharper than the other one. Let's give it a second to load. In this case, they're both pretty sharp all the way to that foreground, but man, that salt looks so much cooler than that one on the left. And that allows me to really get a good close look at that and compare the two. Compositionally speaking, I think I might actually like this higher little bit up here first, and I actually like a bit more of the way this creates a triangle leading you in from the third points. So, same thing, I can go down to the bottom, that's my decision, that's the one I want to work with. Two stars on that one. Let's get into my next stage. Now I'm going to go through, spare you the expense, uh, do this to all of these pictures, and that's going to then bring us to the three star level. I'll show you what we do then. Now sometimes when you pull one up on the screen and you look at it and you go, you know, now that I've got it big, it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. Leave it at one star. It's, it doesn't owe you anything. Keep moving on. Pull up these guys that are similar. All right, I've worked my way through all of those, and I've identified really what it's worth spending more time on. I'm going to go back up to my filter bar, and remember, I'm in my grid view, so I can see this. If you're not in grid view, you can't see this yet, so head back to grid. As long as your filters are still active and rated up here, I'm going to now tell it two stars. It gets rid of all those ones, and now it's showing me the ones that I've deemed worthy to spend some time on. Anyways, let's move on from that to the editing process here. I'm going to take two of these to bring to editing. Let's grab these two here since I really like both of them and they're a different shot so it'll give us something different to work with in the editing process possibly. And I'm going to go to develop now. Now develop is something that you really have to use your artist's eye for. Um, there's a quote from Ansel Adams, the famous photographer from the past, that even if it's a landscape shot, or even if it's a shot of your cereal bowl in the morning, or a necklace that you just bought that you want to show off, you have to consider there's always two people in every shot. There's the photographer, and there's the viewer. So as the photographer, you have this opportunity to show the viewer, anybody that's looking at your photo, the world through your eyes. So you have to look at this photo and really identify what you are trying to pull out of it and what you're trying to show off from it, and that's what we're trying to highlight. What I'm going to get into here, you can do the majority of this in a dark room with old school film photography. So we're not going to be getting into extreme stuff that you would need Photoshop for, but we're going to be able to really pull a lot out of this file. Now this is a raw file. Um, I have a thing that kind of makes RAW a little less intimidating on my blog, I'll put a link down to that below, but the RAW file is going to give us a lot more ability to massage out the detail in these highlights and in these shadows and really work the picture out of here that we want. So shooting that RAW file is something I would 100% recommend. If you're not comfortable with RAW files, you can actually, in most cameras, pair up a RAW file with a JPEG. So it ends up taking both of those pictures at the same time and putting them on your memory card. That way you have those JPEGs you're comfortable with, and that way you've got the shot that you know what it looks like on the rear screen. But as you start to play more with these RAWs, that's there also for you to kind of see the range of that file and to really make it your own. So as you start to use this more and more, I want to say for me it was probably about three months of shooting RAW and JPEG simultaneously before I started to notice my RAW files were the only ones I was using. I never touched the JPEGs. They were just wasted space on my memory card. And that's really when I realized I was a RAW shooter at that point. So in this case, we have a RAW file. As I start to play with this, you're going to have a lot more range to pull out of these shadows than you would if it was a JPEG. The other thing I want to note is in the top sliders here, we have temperature and tint. This is your white balance. You can actually see numbers over here, and these numbers correspond to the number set in the camera. 
it's called Kelvin temperature. Now you might have set it to daylight. If you did that, it was set to 5200. If you set your camera to tungsten, it was set to 3200 probably. Now those numbers, you're not gonna see those if you shot a JPEG. The JPEG's just gonna have zeros there. It's gonna add blue or yellow depending on which way you move in that file, but in this raw file, it's actually adjusting the root of the file itself and it's giving you that ability to really get the light right. So not only do we have more room in this raw file for editing shadows and highlights and really massaging out the detail the way we want, but we also have a much greater ability to fine tune the color in this to the way it actually should have looked. Especially sunsets are really easy to trick cameras. It sees all these nice warm colors and it ends up giving you these weak pastels that you see in your shots if you leave it on auto white balance. It thinks those warm colors shouldn't be there. It thinks it should look like daylight. So it tries to strip them away. It goes to the opposite side. Here, you are controlling that. Now let's play a little bit here. Now in Lightroom, when you're editing, you have two different main areas we're gonna look at. These are called panels from basic down to calibration. And these are known as global adjustments. A global adjustment is gonna affect the entire picture within Lightroom. Up above, we have cropping. This is called the spot removal tool. Like if you have dust in your photos, for instance. This is for red eye or pet eyes. And then these three are different filters to help adjust light. There's a brush up there, there's a graduated filter, and we'll play with one of those in just a minute here. I usually will start with cropping my photo. I want to get a good idea of that frame that I want to work within. Now, I'm not going to crop every photo. So in this case, I might not be cropping it too much, but I can look and see at least if my horizon is straight. I've got these nice guidelines to see if that's all the way across. If it's not, I can come up here and you can see now my cursor has turned to this little curved arrow. And if I click and now drag slowly, you can see it changing the angle that that shot is lying at. I find this a lot easier than coming over to the little angle slider and adjusting it. That really has a hard time for me to kind of fine tune it. You also could click on this little level icon here. Now your cursor becomes a level and you could actually draw right across one side to the other where you want to have your level horizon. Now in this case, I'm gonna reset that crop and just kind of tweak it a little bit to make sure it looks level across there. But this looked like it was set up pretty good out of the box. And I like the framing too, so I don't need to really crop it too much. Now there is no saving in Lightroom. Everything you do is remembered by that catalog step by step. I've only done a crop so far. I can come over to my left side here and I have this panel hidden. But if we open this up, you can actually see here's all of the little tiny adjustments that I just made and those couple temperature, the yellow to blue adjustments that I made. So as I touch sliders, as I crop, as I do anything, it's gonna remember all of those functions that I do. I can step back at any time if I make a mistake. And that way too, you can learn from things a lot more easily. Now I'm gonna start just by massaging out some of that nice sunset. I'm gonna go down to about what would be daylight balance. 5200 in a lot of cameras is considered daylight. Anything between about 5000 to 5500 is usually daylight. Brighten this up a little bit here. Highlights, pull that all the way down so you can see what it does. Pull it all the way up. You notice where it's affecting it in that kind of brighter spots. So if I pull that down a little, look how much more color is coming out in there. My picture's getting a little muddy kind of though. It's losing that pop when I pull those highlights down. So I might actually come down to the whites now and pull that up a little bit and start to see some of that pop come back out in there. Look at the salt start to brighten up a lot more now. Now it's probably a little too bright in that aspect. I can always come back and massage down different aspects later on. This is something where you can go back and forth like a ballet. You're kind of playing with one thing and see how it affects the previous ones. And then you're essentially landing and going, yeah, that looks really pretty. I'm really just experimenting, moving these, seeing what they do as I do so. And I might even go a little past the way I like it and then start to back off a little bit. This is gonna give me the ability to really see and fine tune that detail the way I want it. Now I haven't made a lot of adjustments yet. All I've done is a slight temperature adjustment. 
I've changed the exposure, the highlights, the shadows, the whites, the blacks. Not a lot, just a little bit of massaging of the tone. Let's take a look and see what the before and after looks like already. If I hit the letter Y, that's going to give me a shortcut for before and after. And already you can see a lot more of that sunset coming out. I can see more detail in that foreground. It's starting to draw the eye in a very different way. I'm going to hit Y again, so I'm back to my full screen. And down below here I have texture, clarity, dehaze, vibrance, and saturation. So the texture is going to help increase... Look at that salt. But eventually it starts to get too kind of crispy looking and fake and too sharp, kind of. I try to use this lightly. I might, in an image like this where I want a little bit more of that bite from that salt, pull that up to, you know, 10 or 15 or so and see how it looks. Same thing with clarity. I might bring that up a little bit, but be very careful. You can easily go heavy handed with this. In a landscape like this, you know, like with anything, you know, it's made to break rules, but my rule is usually stopping at about 20 with the clarity. So that doesn't mean I'm going to crank it to 20 every time, but once you get up past there, it can really start to look kind of unnatural. So I'm going to bring that back down here. And I'm not watching the numbers or the slider, I'm watching the image, because remember, that's what's important here, not the number that you set. That's going to be different for every image. It's how does that picture look? Vibrance and saturation are close cousins. Vibrance increases the balance of colors, where saturation takes all of those colors at once and increases the intensity of them. So if I take vibrance, for instance, in this shot, and the blues are already pretty well represented, so are the oranges, but the yellows maybe aren't as strong, you'll see that it'll bring up the tones that aren't as vibrant and help them balance out to the other ones to make them as vibrant. Sometimes you want the balance of color, but now it's too intense. So I might crank up that vibrance pretty high and then start to back off the saturation to take some of that color intensity away. So right now, I mean, this is a little atypical because we have a really unique scenario. We've got a salt flat. We've got a blue hour just post sunset. There's a lot of interesting colors in there. So by increasing that vibrance by a quite a bit, a lot more than I normally might, I started to balance out a lot of those colors within there and give them their own kind of equal say, but then they were way too much, so by backing off that saturation, we get that natural look back in there again. Same thing, this is a ballet. We go back and forth with these. That might now make something else look a little funky. Back that off and nudge and nudge and nudge until you get to that look we're looking for. Now this is a pretty close to done photo almost. This is one that we're not doing a lot of in-depth editing in, and neither of them today are we going to really go crazy in depth with. But there's one little trick I'm going to show you. This is ubiquitous against especially landscape photographers from the very early days all the way through current. This is something that's going to draw your eye really more towards the subject that we want and keep you centered within that photo. So I'm going to now go to close my basic panel and open up my effects panel. This is going to allow me to create a vignette, darkened edges. This is a really expensive lens made to not vignette from edge to edge. It's made to be as clean as possible and now I'm going to take that and just destroy it and put my own vignette in there. So let's go ahead. I'm going to take this amount and go all the way to minus 100. I'm going to get them as dark as possible in the edges. We're not going to leave it there, don't worry. I'm just shaping that vignette first, and then we're going to back it off to almost nothing. We don't want the viewer to know we've done this. We want this subconsciously to draw their eye towards the center of the photo. The brightest spot of an image is where you will automatically gravitate towards. And if we can ever so slightly darken these edges, we don't want them to know we did that, but it's going to keep them focused in the center of our photo. So by doing so here, I can actually change my midpoint and center around where I want the eye to draw. Right now, we're also at a bit of kind of a pretty well-defined edge. We can blend that more with feathering. Or we can, you know, make it look like a heat hole if we needed to. Depends on the shot you're trying to do. Roundness, how circular or how square or oval is that? Same thing, I can really shape this the way that I want. Now highlights is something that I will often use in these landscape scenarios. 
In a portrait, I generally want, because we want an even vignette to kind of draw your eye inwards and not give it away in the exterior. But if we have these little veins of salt, for instance, coming in, and they're darkened compared to the ones next to it, you're going to really start to notice that. If you've got big puffy white clouds and you darken that, that's going to actually kind of give it away to the subconscious of the viewer that you've done this. So by pulling the highlights all the way up right now, you notice the highlights over here in the corner have re-emerged, and now as we back off this amount to where we want it, it looks a lot more natural. Now, it's really hard to see what that vignette looks like right now. It's there, but it's kind of hard to tell exactly where. And if you notice right now on the top heading bar for my panel for effects, on the opposite side of the word, the left side over here, we have these little kind of gray-black boxes. That's a before and after box. For each one of these, except for basic, we can say, well, what's it look like if I didn't make that adjustment? So I can come here and click this little guy. And you can see the difference between my before and after vignetted shot. That might actually still be a little bit too far out. going before and after again. So if you did not watch me do that, you would have no idea I did that to this shot. But it ever so slightly draws your eye central into the image, and it doesn't allow you to leave as easily. If you did watch me do that, you can clearly see that the sky's a little darker and the bottom edges are a little bit darker. But that's what we're trying to do. We want to kind of trick the viewer into staying with our picture longer rather than leaving ours and going to the next one on the wall next to it. So by doing these little tricks with light, and this is something you would have done in the darkroom by blocking light or creating more light in different areas, we can really engage the viewer a lot more. Now I like that shot quite a bit the way it is. I don't know if there's not much more I would do to it. I might try to brighten it up a little bit now with the exposure because of the darkening of the edges. It does allow me to kind of brighten it a bit and not lose the detail. That massaging back and forth we were talking about earlier, that's what I'm doing now. You can see that already starting to come out a little bit. If I look and scrutinize the horizon right now too, after looking at it for a while, I think it's a little askew. I can go back into my crop if I need to and change that horizon ever so slightly. Let's see if that looks a little more even. I think it does. Now, if I come back and open this tomorrow and I go, oh, man, no, that horizon definitely looks a little bit more cockeyed now, I can go back in at any time and always readjust this. It's never baking anything in. It's the original picture that came out of your camera with Lightroom's history in its catalog remembering everything you did. So you never have to worry about kind of anything. If you look down the history here, here's everything we've done to this picture. If you look at that little preview up above in the navigator, as I hover over it, it shows you each step individually. Now I like that a lot. Let's take just a quick look at it in full screen. I'm going to hit the letter F real quick, which shows me full screen. I don't see it with anything else. To me, that looks great. I'm going to go ahead and hit F again to shrink my screen. And let's go to the next picture here that I wanted to play with. Now in this case, the composition is a little bit maybe lower than I would want it. So let's start again by going to develop, and then I'm going to go to crop, and I'm going to create really the shape that I want here, the way they'll lead the eye around. Notice here in my crop tool, you have the word original, which is the aspect ratio that you had shot this picture, and I personally want to keep it in the same aspect ratio right now. If I make sure this is locked, I can then grab any corner or any side, and it'll keep the same 2 to 3 aspect ratio as my camera sensor. And right now, that's the way I'm going to kind of try to keep it. Let's see here if we can find something a little more appealing using that curve, using the shadows and light. I think that might look pretty good, so I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter or Done, and that's going to give me a better idea. I might want a little less sky in there. Blue sky is pretty, but it really doesn't add a lot. It's not like there's really nice clouds, so let's see if bringing it down a little more changes it. It might be a little too much sand now, 
compared to the sky. So let's nudge her back up again. Just a little bit here. And all these little subtle movements matter in your photography. It may take you a while to find the way you like it, too. Let yourself play a little bit. I'm starting to like this a little bit more now. Let's see if I bring it over here a bit. How does this walk my eye across? I think we're starting to get something now. If you notice, this starts to come up the sand dune from about a third, draw you around. These bright guys pull your eye back in. And then all of this sand with these little ripples give us some really nice texture in that foreground. All right, I like that. I think we're going to go with that. Now remember, if I want to change it later on, not set in stone. I can change that at any point. Now in this case, I'm going to start in the same area, and we're going to go back to our exposure. See how that kind of plays a bit. And I had a pretty good exposure here, but if I brighten it a bit and then pull my highlights down, start to see a bit more come out from this. Pull up those whites a bit. Now there's nothing white within this photograph, so I don't want this to be cranked up all the way to where my whites are clipping, what's known as losing detail on the highlights. Over here in my histogram, this graph showing me the visual light in my picture, if it ends up touching the edge here, this little triangle is going to turn a light gray color, and that's going to tell me that I'm starting to lose detail in my brightest spots. If I had bright white clouds up here, I'd be watching that to make sure I didn't lose detail there. We can already start to see, though, a lot more of this picture start to come out. Pull up the shadows maybe a little bit. This was early morning. We've got some nice sun coming in. Let's go back up to the 5200, which is your daylight white balance. It's pretty easy to set for a shot that should be lit by the sun and looking nice. And you notice how it warms up and now looks a little more like that sunrise, a little better. I don't want to go too buck wild with the texture. There's already quite a bit with that sand. We might go up a little bit to help accentuate it. Same thing, the clarity will help make that stand out a bit more. And this already has a lot of punch to it. I don't want to bring up those colors too much. I might do the same trick we did before and kind of desaturate it a bit. Bring some more of that natural look coming out of it. Let's just take a quick look with hitting Y to see our before and after. And already, a lot more punch from it. It's already drawing the eye through. We can still see detail within the shadows. Everything's kind of leading me through nicely now. I will be doing more in editing in later Lightroom Whisperer and Lightroom Whisperer Sweet Nothing videos. So I'm going to actually not be dealing with a lot of these in-between panels for now, and we're not going to go too in-depth in a lot of the local adjustments, mainly just because these images didn't really need it too much. Sure, we want to massage out the things here and there, but they weren't in any extreme need. We're going to get into some extreme editing in some later videos, so make sure to subscribe and like this video, which will help other people see it. That way you're not going to miss any of them when we do jump much more in depth in the editing process. For now, I want to still come down here to my effects, just like we did last time, and let's just see what it looks like with a bit more of a vignette coming through here again, drawing the eye and leading it through. Now, if you think this is kind of cheating, and drawing the eye through where it's unnaturally doing so. Um, let's just say I've worked for some of the top photographers out there in the past couple decades. I have not met one yet that does not do this in his final editing process. Go ahead and back that off now that I've got my shape set. Bring my midpoint a bit more, see how that looks. Let's see that before and after again. Same thing. You really don't notice it until you watch me do the process. If I go before and after here again, it's subtle, but it keeps you confined in that shot. It brings you much more to that center point. I like that one. Let's go ahead and hit four stars on it. Four means I want to share that with people. It means it's good enough that if I do a quick search and say, show me four or higher, I can be confident that they're going to be pictures that I'm OK sharing with anybody from friends to strangers. I'm going to hit grid. We're going to go back here, and we've got 
our other picture, which I didn't hit four on, I'm going to go and update that. And if we take these up to our full screen now, I can go and highlight both of them, hit the letter F, and we can look at our shots. Now I want to do something with these pictures. And Lightroom um, needs something called an export to get it out into the real world. So what that's going to do, it's going to take all of those adjustments you just did and then take the original picture and make a copy of it with all of those adjustments baked in and put it where you tell it to. I want to email this to some friends and show them these two shots from Death Valley. So I'm going to start by clicking Export. This is going to now bring up a menu where, same thing as before, it's going to put them where I tell them to. So I'm going to make sure first that it's exporting to my hard drive. I'm going to put it in a specific folder. I want that folder to be on my desktop. For me, I'm relatively computer illiterate, despite the fact I know this program really well. So if I have it sitting on my desktop and I want to make an email, I can easily grab that, put it in the email, and drag it over there or add it to the email, knowing where it is. It's not in some random folder that I'm not exactly sure where. So here I have it putting it on my desktop. I want to put it in a subfolder. I just don't want these plopping them right everywhere. So I want this folder to be called, let's call it Death Valley Winners. And now I'm going to keep scrolling down, and I don't want to rename these. There's no reason for me to, so I'm just going to leave them the same as the file name in the camera. This is a JPEG file, and that's what I want to export. 90% of the time, possibly more, you're going to be exporting JPEG files. If you're making a big print, the printer might ask for a TIFF file. If you're in a photo club and they want to see the editing process, or if you're on one of my workshops and I want to see every single step you did, then I'm going to have you export a DNG. That's actually a raw file with Adobe's whole language built into it so I can see all the filters you did and everything else and be able to help correct you along the way more easily. In this case, we want this to be a JPEG because I want to be able to email it, use it online, and not have it choke up an email system. I have the quality set pretty high. If you're going to be printing it, I do want it to be generally up pretty high there in a JPEG, where computer screen-wise, even if you're in the 70 realm, you're going to be perfectly fine. Now I'm going to leave it a little bit higher just in case somebody does want to print this. And image sizing is relatively important here. If you have this unchecked, it's the original size of the photo, which might be pretty darn big. If you're going to be printing this, great, you need that size. But in this case, I want this to be web-sized. I want this to be filling a computer screen and not much larger. And that way, it's not choking up email. It's not this gigantic file. So when I click this, the ability for me to choose the way I want it to rate, and I'm just going to say long edge. And in the world of computer screens, HD, high definition, is 1920 for the long side. So I have that entered there. Screens are generally 72 DPI. That's what the resolution is, and it's going to remember this for me until the next time I need to change it. The rest of these I'll be going more in depth on in other Sweet Nothings videos, but for today's export we don't need to worry about metadata, sharpening, watermarks, or anything like that. Now that I've got it, and I'm just going to double check, go into my Death Valley Winners folder on my desktop, making a JPEG that's only the size of an HD computer screen monitor. I can say Export. Now, if you look in the upper left, it shows me a progress bar that it's exporting those files currently. Once it's done, they're going to be in a folder on my desktop, which if we minimize right now, there's a Death Valley Winners folder over here. And if I go and I open that up, there's our two files, fully edited, ready to email to people. That's really it. Yeah, it's a process. But this is your art form. This is really the way you're trying to represent the thing that you saw to the people that you want to show it to. So let yourself have some fun with it. You're allowed to have some creativity with this from time to time. Don't really confine yourself as much as you think you need to. You can always pull it back, but let yourself experiment a little bit in the editing process. Mainly, though, making sure you're instituting that workflow. Something from the time you import to the ability to organize these photos a little bit more, narrowing them down to see which ones you want to work on, and then finally getting to that editing process. If you keep those stages intact, you're going to notice that you're able to polish it up and make it a lot faster through those stages, and you're really going to be able to pull out those photos that you want to work on a lot more easily. From the Lightroom Whisperer, thanks for spending some time with me. We'll see you next time. <laughs>